chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he, and he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Praise God for the hearing of these sacred words. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, week two now of our October sermon series. And this sermon series this month is on community, community, church as community. And you might remember that we've been working off of this chart that came right off of the United Methodist Church's website. And so you remember worship? In September, we did a series on worship. The next is community. Then we'll move on to spiritual practices and service. So last week, Pastor Andy preached the first sermon on community, introducing us to the topic, church's community. And he, he showed us how in order to build a community, it requires three Ps. The first P is purpose, which for the United Methodist Church, the stated purpose is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. For us, we emphasize that as well, we emphasize that we want to be a safe and non-judgmental community in the name of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the first P. The second P is a part to play. In order for us to be a community, everybody has to have a part to play, actively involved in the, in the life of the church. And finally, the third P, to build community in a church is the ability to pivot Change is inevitable. Our ability to react to that change is important to continue to build community. Today, our focus on this sermon on community is church as home. Church as a place that feels like home a place where you love to be and you'd never leave. There might be a pastoral change, but it's your church, it's home, it's your family. We're going to concentrate on that today. Now, personally, it has taken me a while, or it took me a while, to get there. And I'm going to share with you a bit of my journey. It's going to be kind of a confession, I guess, but I'm going to do that. But before we get into that, let's pray. Gracious God, it's good to be in your temple, among your people, your family, your children, in the presence of your spirit and your word. Help us, Lord, to be a church, to be a community, to be a family, to be like home. Christ's name we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. The church is about we, not me. The, the church is about we, not me, or you. The church is about us as family. But as I suggested, it, it took me a little while in my faith walk to to get there, and as I said, this might be a bit of a confession, but I'm sure some of you can relate. I'm going to share with you three stages. These are broad categories, and they're probably overly simplified. But in that first stage, I know that the church was communicating more than this, but what seemed urgent to me was that it was all about me, and about me making a decision, you know, for Christ. Why? Because what I was hearing was that I was a sinner deserving of hell, but that was okay because Jesus died in my place. 
and I got a get out of hell free card. Okay, so that, that was, I know there was more. I know there must have been more. But that seemed urgent. And then, after I got under some teaching that was more grace-filled, I began to realize that I was loved unconditionally by God. God loved me unconditionally, and that's what kept me safe. And that I think was an improvement over that first stage, but it was still about me and my safety and being saved and about my own salvation. And then over time, I came to realize what you probably realize already is that it's not about me. (laughs) It's about we. It's about us, it's about community, it's about family, and it's about home. Now, I'll say this quickly, we do not lose our individuality in the community, our individual identity, our individual integrity, our individual worth, our growth as individuals, all of that is important but church is about we. It's about family. It's about home. It's about relationships. The Gospel of John is big on relationships. I want to share with you some scriptures that come outside of our text today, and then we'll finally get to our text. In the prologue, the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John, uh, we get this. And the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son full of grace and truth just a little bit later in the prologue the writer writes this from his fullness we have received grace upon grace In Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, remember that? Jesus says to Nicodemus, Truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. And then with Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman, Jesus says to her, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. We, we, we. John was written by the community. Now, there may have been one person holding the pen, but it sure seems like it was written by the community and for the community. Jesus, and a little bit later, still in in the Gospel of John, says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now I want to share with you a text a little bit longer uh, from 1 John. We've been in the Gospel of John, now 1 John, which was either written by the writer of John or at least was written from John's community. Listen to this. This is great. We declare to you what was from the beginning that we have heard, that we have seen with our eyes, that we have looked and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us, that we have seen and heard. We also declare to you so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be completed. This is the thing about church. It's community. It's family. It's home. Why was John's community so concerned about community? Because they had been kicked out of their community. 
in the early years of the church. The church was made up of all Jews. And then when the Gentiles came in, it grew into Gentile territories. But even among the Jews, some believed and some did not. And those who did not kicked John's community out of the synagogue, but they maintained their community as followers of Christ. I checked a couple of sources uh, in, in my study for definitions or lists of what it means that the church is like family or like home. Uh, here's a four-point list. The church is like a family in that we are joined together by something greater than our personal preferences or life circumstances. There's something greater that's going on. It's not just about me, right? There's something greater going on that we do share in common that brings us together. Two, we have our traditions and our celebrations that are passed down from generation to generation, just like our families. We're not not in too much more time, we're going to enter into the holiday season, all sorts of traditions in the family there and even in the church. And so we're like our families in that we have traditions that are important to us. Uh, trunks of treats has become a tradition and wow, wow, what a family community <laughs> event that was, right? And so we are creating new traditions all, all of the time. Three, uh, we don't always get along, but that doesn't stop us from having each other's backs. Don't want to paint an idealistic picture of family life or church life. <laughs> it doesn't always go as we want it to go, but there's forgiveness because we're family. And because we're family, we have each other's backs. And four, we get fed constantly whether we're hungry or not just like i shared in a previous sermon just like my grandmothers and my aunts when we get together for a family meal they were always looking at us do you have enough what else can we get you we want to fill you up you need to eat same thing happens in the church we are fed fed by each other one more list a church is like a family because it's a place to belong. A church is like a family because it's a, it's a place to grow spiritually. A church is like a family because it's a place to build relationships. It's a place to pray together. It's a place to support others. It's a place to reconcile. The church is not a building. The church is not an organization. The church is not an institution. The church is not an association. The church is not a club. The church is community family. It's home. So why is it that way? What is at the heart of church as home? Where does that come from? Well, Pastor Andy hit on that in the introductory sermon last week on this sermon series on community when he referenced the Apostle Paul and his famous illustration of the church as the body of Christ. Christ is at the head, and we are all members of the body, all with a function to perform, supporting one another that the body might operate as it is intended to operate. This week, we come to the Gospel of John. And you could find other scripture references that would support church as family and church as home. They're everywhere. Pastor Andy chose this. It's not, you won't find it in most uh, sermons or most articles about the church as home, but I like, I like that he picked it, and we're going to dig into it. 
In the Gospel of John, John and John's community, they are always operating on two levels. John is operating on a surface level or a, a story level, and then he's operating on a deeper level or a symbolic level. In our gospel story today, Jesus is passing by and John the Baptist sees him and says, look, the Lamb of God and two of John the Baptist's disciples, and by the way, he's never called John the Baptist in the gospel of John, he, he's John the witness, and he's witnessing to Jesus and two of John the Baptist's followers follow Jesus, two levels. They literally, on the story level, turned and followed Jesus down the road. On a deeper level, they followed Jesus as disciples of Christ. And then the dialogue that follows, it is so brief, but it is so deep, but it begins with the surface level and then goes deep. The first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of John are these. The disciples walk, follow Jesus. Jesus turns and says, what are you looking for? The first word. What are you looking for? On the surface, in the story, we're going to find out that they're looking for for where Jesus is staying. On the deeper level, is there a more important question than what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Whether we know it or not, we're looking for Jesus. We are looking for Jesus. The disciples answer in a strange way. They answer with another question. And the disciples say, where are you staying? On the surface level, where are you staying? Where are you living? But on the deeper level, where are you staying? The Greek word that gets translated staying here is the word meno. It appears more than 40 times in the Gospel of John. It is an important word then and an important concept in the Gospel of John. It's often translated abiding, remaining, and it represents the relationship between God and Christ, that God abides in Christ and Christ abides in God. Christ abides in his followers and his followers abide in him. It's about a relationship. Where are you staying? The first time this word minnow appears is in this first chapter. It's verse 32, and it says this. It says, And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. It remained on him. It minnowed on him. It abided in him. And so we're, now we're talking about the Spirit. We're talking about the Spirit. And the Spirit comes, it abides in Jesus, and it abides in us. And then Jesus' answer is this. Come and see. On the surface level, come and see where I'm staying tonight. On the deeper level, the question is for all of us. Come. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Come and experience Jesus for yourself. Come to Methodist Temple and experience what it's like to be in a family like this. Come and see. 
As I was preparing the sermon this week, I was listening to music, and I don't always listen to music uh, to get any kind of a specific inspiration. It's general inspiration, and it's not, a, it's not always Christian music. Usually it's not. But I do like to notice in secular music, particularly in love songs, I like to notice that, that God's in there, uh, that Jesus is in there. Uh, that that we're, anytime we're talking about love, whether the writer of the song was thinking about God, if we're talking about love, that's God's domain. So I'm listening uh, to Spotify, and I was actually, um, I wasn't listening to uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash and & Young, but it just went there. I was in that, you know, I was in that uh, era, <laughs> and this uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young song came up, and I'm thinking about home, thinking about the church as home, and the song that they played was Our House. Our House was written by Graham Nash, uh, and it was about Joni Mitchell playing her love songs to him in their home where they lived outside of Los Angeles. We can't play it because we'd, you know, we'd get caught by the uh, YouTube uh, uh, folks, but, and I can't sing it even though they wouldn't recognize the song uh, if, I, if I tried to sing it. But let, listen, to, listen to these words and think about whether these don't describe Jesus pretty well. This is Graham Nash singing to Joni Mitchell. This is Jesus singing to us. I'll light the fire. You place the flowers in the vase you bought today. Staring at the fire for hours and hours while I listen to you. Play your love songs all night long for me. Only for me. Come to me now. And rest your head for just five minutes. Everything is done. Such a cozy room. The windows are illuminated by the evening sunshine through them, fiery gems. For you, only for you. Our house is a very, very, very fine house with two cats in the yard. Life used to be so hard. Now everything is easy because of you. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave you? And where does it leave me? Well, it could lead you to join, to become a member of Methodist Temple, to Join as a member of Methodist Temple, and if you haven't been baptized, to be baptized. And you think membership, membership, that sounds institutional, but no, it's not institutional at all. Member means limb, an arm, and a leg, a member of the body, and we're back to the body of Christ. And so if you're not a member, consider being a member, and there's a membership class coming up, and you can look into it further. But consider joining the family. Consider making this your church home and be baptized. Be baptized. Baptism is so rich in meaning, but in John, the meaning of baptism is connected to the coming of the Spirit. John saw the Spirit like a dove fall on Jesus at Jesus' baptism. Consider being baptized. I love the story in, in Acts where the question is asked, hey, what, what would prevent us, what would prevent me from being baptized? And Philip tells the Ethiopian eunuch, nothing. They came across a body of water, he pulled him down off the chariot and, and baptized him. So we can baptize you. There's nothing that prevents that. So the church, it's not an institution, it's not an organization. The church is home. Amen.